Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. A caravan of folks riding in from the east would have been a pretty normal occurrence in Jerusalem back in Jesus' day. But what would have set our wise men apart today would have been their question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? You see, everyone knew that Herod wasn't born king of the Jews. He had been appointed by the emperor. So he was hardly a Jew, and he wasn't really a king. So either the Magi were deeply confused, or something really bad was about to happen. These guys are toast. Everyone must have thought as they ushered him through the streets to Herod's palace. And then the Magi, with smiling faces, would have posed their question to Herod. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And then you can probably picture Herod laughing a little bit, looking around his throne room and asking, do I look like I was born yesterday? And then the weight of the words would have finally hit him. There's someone else who has been born king of the Jews, born and not appointed. So then his gears start turning, and Herod has to eliminate the threat. So he attempts to coerce the wise men into becoming pawns in his game of political power. But little does Herod know that these and unwitting magi have already been captured and made characters in a grander game, a more intense battle and a much more beautiful story. By causing the star to appear to the magi and setting them on the path to Judea, God led the magi into the role he had written for them from before the foundations of the world. It wasn't just a chance occurrence that these magi saw the star and decided to follow it. God had always intended for them to come and worship at the feet of Jesus. But the magi themselves probably didn't even realize this about their mission. What little bit they had known about it had to be revealed to them. And that's what an epiphany is, right? It's a, re a revelation of some great truth, something that on our own we wouldn't have been able to understand. Instead, epiphanies have to be given to us, and usually they happen again and again, right? They come in waves. When we think we've grasped a concept or think we've understood why something happened, then another thing is revealed to us that changes the way we see the whole situation. So the Magi might have under, thought they understood what was going on. Maybe they thought they were fulfilling some ancient duty to honor new kings. Maybe something their band of sages had done for generations. Or maybe curiosity dragged them along the king's highway to figure out this phenomenon of the star. Or maybe they were just seeking adventure, trying to sort out a midlife crisis, or just trying to settle some uneasiness in their souls. No matter what the wise men thought or hoped they were doing, God had revealed only one thing to them, one task. And when they arrive in Jerusalem, their mouths confess what that one task is. They have come to worship the newborn king. They have come to worship Jesus. And this one task, this, this task that worship is what we are to do, that, I think, is one of the great revelations in the epiphany of our Lord. It's not just that the Gentiles are brought into the story of salvation. There's something deeper here, a deeper truth. And it's that God calls all people to one singular task of worshiping Jesus. No matter how divergent our intents, no matter how different our backgrounds, God leads us to worship him in the flesh. And there are those, of course, who say no to it, but even they, too, someday will have to bend the knee. And this is important for us because 
with the infant Jesus, there's one question. What do we do with this Jesus? I'm sure that's something even Mary and Joseph were asking. What do we do with Jesus? And the Magi come and give the answer. We don't pinch his cheeks like just another baby. We don't say, oh, he'll grow up to be such a good man who will do many great things. None of that. We, like the Magi, bend our knee with fellow believers and worship Jesus, who is true God and true man. Isaiah captures this beautifully in our Old Testament reading. In the midst of darkness, the light of God's glory rises and shines, and all people are drawn to it. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising, Isaiah writes. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult. This is the joy that comes in worship of God. All people are brought together in this one glorious multitude. And they move together to the baby sitting on Mary's lap. They're brought from countless places, countless backgrounds, and they're all set on one new journey. And so the light shines and they make it their goal to enter into the presence of that light. The thing is, a task like this, a task like worship, requires that God moves first. God is the one who must first be born king of the Jews. God is the one who has to first place his star in the sky. God must first set us on the path to his presence. Sometimes we think we're so wise and enlightened that we can bring ourselves to Jesus. But that's not even remotely possible. If we tried to bring ourselves to Jesus, we'd end up like the Magi, wandering confused into Herod's court and looking for him in all the places where he certainly is not. But instead, God gives us his star, the shining light that leads us to where he is present. And he's present not in the palaces of kings, but in the simple house where the holy family dwells. And so he leads us here to this house to worship and adore him. We do have to understand, though, what that worship looks like. When it comes to the Magi, and we think about their worship, we usually tie it to their gifts, right? Their gold and frankincense and myrrh. But their worship doesn't center on their gifts. Pay close attention to how it's written. The Magi went into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then there's, there's this energy and devotion to this worship. They're literally prostrating themselves, falling on their faces at the feet of Jesus. And then once the worship is complete, then, then they open their treasures and offer gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's almost like the gifts are an afterthought. It's like they whispered to one another, we just met the God of the universe. We probably have to give him something. And so they rush out to the car and they're rummaging through their suitcases to try to find something to give him. And what they do, they find the best of what they have with them. They offer their very best to this little infant. Gold as for a king, incense as for God, myrrh as for one who would soon be dead. And no doubt, these gifts were graciously received, but then carefully set aside, because the real gift sat on Mary's lap. And receiving that gift, the gift of God himself, is what true worship looks like. And in that worship, we're united with the Magi and all believers. So to the average eye, there's really no rhyme or reason to the people Jesus wraps up into his story. The wise men came out of left field. No one expected them to show up. Most of us, too, would, would prefer Jesus only choose those nice church-going types with a mom and a dad and 2.5 children, the ones who are good rule followers who make good money and embrace those good middle-class virtues of 
thriftiness, safety, and acceptance. These are the kind of people we think make the perfect Christians. But then God uses the very last people we expect to show us what true worship looks like. Eastern sages, dirty fishermen, women of ill repute, political rebels, these people are the ones who know how to worship. And then Jesus goes and binds us with those people, right? We who revel in our own self-centered piety, we're, we get tied to these horrible people. But that's only because we're just as horrible as they are. He has made us all together, fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promises of Christ. So together we unite in worship of the infant on Mary's lap. We receive his gifts. We receive his promises of forgiveness, life, and salvation. We receive the gifts of his very body and blood. And that is the one thing he has called us to do. That's the one task he's revealed to us. And in receiving that revelation that is worship of Christ, that is where we see true discipleship beginning. So let's depart then with the Magi on that other way. And by God's grace, we'll find ourselves returning to the heavenly country, which is eternity in God's presence. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.